What's up HVAC Control Pro? This is Eric Stromquist with Control Trends and StromquistandCompany.com. It has been a while since we've spoken. I have been traveling. Myself and my cohort at Control Trends, the man, myth, the legend, the one, the only Kenny Smyers, have been covering conferences. If you follow Control Trends, you know we've been to Detroit, to ControlsCon. I've been out to Haystack in San Diego for the Haystack Connect Conference. And most recently, we went to Europe to cover the EZIO Global Conference in Amsterdam and shot a lot of video at all these, which is up on the uh, YouTube channel as well as controltrends.com. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. But hey, I want to get back to some of the basics, man. We want to continue our Valve series today. Uh, if you've been following it, we are now up to part three with Control Pro Tim Shamboy. And in this uh, part of the training, Tim breaks down two and three way valves. He breaks down ball valves. He breaks down pressure independent control valves, uh, primarily Belimos. Siemens also has one, as, as does Honeywell and others, and the Belimo energy valve. Tim gets into piping, he gets into pressure, pressure drops. It is some good stuff. So check it out. We'll see you on the flip side. Now, let's talk about valves. Uh, valves come in a variety of flavors. Butterfly, ball, globe, okay. Uh, in the past, historically, um, we had lots of valves like this, and this could be a three inch valve, it could be a half inch valve, but the the internal dynamics is the same. You pop one of these on here, spring return, pulls the stem up and it either opens it or it closes it. Are you with me? Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, and, and these things gave pretty good performance as far as if it was opened up a little bit, it's gonna flow a little bit. If it's open a lot, it'll, it'll flow a lot. All right. Ball valves, on the other hand, if you open them up a little bit, they flow a lot. <laughs> and so uh, people tended to go with the mixing, I mean, not the, the globe, because of their performance. And, and back in the day, that's just how everything was structured. It just worked better that way. Um, nowadays, we're going with uh, more commonly ball valves and the ball valves will have what's called a characterized disc and in a couple of slides I'll show you what that disc w does for you okay uh, first let's talk about pressures we, we have to understand uh, you know when we if we put a, a valve in uh, maybe change out a valve, again, changing out uh, old style to new style. Uh, we need to be concerned with close off pressure, uh, differential pressure, and uh, body pressure. And the body pressure typically is irrelevant unless you're in one of these high rise buildings downtown, and then burst pressure is very important. But if it's a lower building, we're, we're not as concerned about this. We, we do want to know what our delta P is, and often we don't know that. Often it is ignored, uh, but it is important. And close-off pressure is, is kind of important. Now, close-off is more, impre uh, more important with a globe than a ball valve. A globe valve, um, the way it works, here's uh, uh, an illustration. Now look at this valve right here. Let's say you've got an actuator that's trying to close this valve. What's it doing to the stem? It's pushing it down. Okay. Now, water is trying to fight that pushing, correct? And so you have to have enough force on that actuator to overcome the force of that water. All right. Now, if you don't, if you put too weak an actuator 
on a globe valve and you stick it in a, a circuit and it starts throttling, what will happen is this, this chattering that will resonate through a whole floor, building floor. It sounds like you, you take a, a big wooden heavy table and drag it across a concrete floor. Can you, you, you just get a feel for what that might sound like? How many of you have heard a valve do that? You know, it's, it's quite significant. Uh, for that reason, I kind of like if you're, if you're adding, let's say you've got a typical office building. Uh, often, uh, it, a tenant might add a water source heat pump for a little data room, and you just pipe off the uh, condenser loop, and, and we need to regulate that water. A lot of times we'll put it through a three-way valve, put it on an actuator, and we just have to understand. See, that we're trying to be engineers. Often, a, a, a scenario like that, an engineer is not involved. A am, I, am I correct? All right. How many times have you been involved with that? All right, now you are selecting the valve. All right, you've got to make sure that you do due diligence and, and make sure that you get the right components of the right size and the right power and the right control signal. All this stuff has to come together. All right. So make sure you've got enough oomph, enough power on that actuator to overcome that pressure. Uh, by the way, this is a two-way <coughs> valve. Next is a three-way valve. We've got a three-way valve mixing, and we've got three-way valve diverting. Now, the piping of these things, um, let's see if I can dig this out. Uh, we typically like our control valves in the return coming out of the coil. Uh, two-way, pretty straightforward, no big deal. Three-way, what we do, we've got our supply coming in. We've got a three-way valve, so this valve will either... Uh, allow flow through the coil or it will bypass around the coil and that is very very common okay. in fact uh, it's common w w when we add a, a water source heat pump or if we go to the air handler how often do we see three-way valves do we see more three-way valves than two-way valves very very common all right <clears throat> If a three-way valve is, is working, it's, it, we're bypassing. What are we bypassing? 45, 44, 42 degree water, whatever our supply of water is. Which means, let's say it's 45 degree water here. If we send all of it through the coil, what's, what's coming out here? Well, actually with a two-way valve, we're going to... 55 in and we should have 55 out with a three-way valve where we're bypassing. We're going to send some water through the coil so and some water bypassing. So what's happening is we're blending 45 degree water with 55 degree water so the water out is not 55 degrees. You do that all across the building. Now you go to the chiller room and you look at the... Uh, thermometers on that chiller and you see 45 out and what's coming back? <laughs> I heard a 52, if you're lucky. I heard a 47, very common. Now, put yourself in the shoes of that chiller. You want to make 10 degrees. All of a sudden you're making 2 degrees. Are you happy? A chiller that is not happy acts up. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Which in our line of work sometimes is good. <laughs> we like chillers that act up. However, uh, what we want to do is do what's right by our customer. And uh, a, a chiller that sees that uh, a good load, it, it's a happy chiller. It's going to act up less. And, and a chiller that's, that's actually working well, it's going to drink less power. Georgia Power will not be as happy with you.
<laughs> okay, all right. So there's always going to be somebody unhappy. <laughs> all right. Now, let's, uh, let's contrast that with uh, this three-way valve. We got mixing, we got diverting. Diverting, well, mixing again, just to uh, you know, emphasize, you've got two streams coming in and you've got one stream going out. Diverting, you've got one stream coming in and you're sending it one direction or another. Does that make sense? So a mixing valve inherently is, uh, it, it, it lends itself well to modulating. A diverting valve typically is two position. Now, there's times when you can uh, have a uh, two position operation with a mixing valve. There's times when you can kind of do a little blending of water with a diverting valve, but typically no. Now, um, I've got some cutaways, and this is going to be great for uh, some of you guys. Excuse me. The mixing is very much directional dependent. You got to put it in. Uh, yes, yes. All right. I'm going to send out these, uh, pass out these cutaways, and you will actually see the difference in construction between a mixing and a diverting valve. So I'm going to start them over here, just messing with them. Now, um, let's w let's look at these valves in a different light. Let's say you need to replace one. You call us up and you say, I got to have a valve of this size, and you, you give us the different uh, information. But we're going to ask you, is it normally open or normally closed? Now, if you go to a valve and that valve has a tag on it, boy, it's nice when we can get the information off that tag because we, we, that tells us everything we need to know. But sometimes people take those tags off and they don't put them back on. Now that should be a capital offense. Yeah. Uh, punishable by very bad things. Uh, but it happens. All right, so let's say you've got a valve and, and there's no numbers on it. Well, now we got to do some figuring. All right, you're gonna. We're, we've got to know: is it normally open or normally closed? I've got uh, cutaways right here of normally open and normally closed, but there, it's illustrated right here. This uh, is is. Oh, I don't see a. I don't see a tag on this. Can y'all help me out? Is this normally open or normally closed? Normally open. Why would you say this is normally open? All right, I, historically, these valves had pneumatic actuators that had springs that would pull the, the stem up. Now, there's exceptions to that, <laughs> but for the most part, what, what, what I like to, uh, to clarify it is say normally open stem up, because now with electrical valves, it's, it's a little less obvious, okay? So let's say stem up, normally open or normally closed. Does that make sense? Now, how can you tell if you don't have numbers on the valve, if it's normally open or normally closed? Um, and, and specifically with uh, the, this two-way. All right, now, notice if an actuator pulls this uh, stem up, it's going to pull it away from the seat, it, correct? If this was normally closed, where would that stem be? It would look more like this. So ignore this B port. So, you know, this is just plugged off. So let's consider this is normally closed and this is normally open. Again, with a stem up. Do you see how stem up? This plunger goes against the seat here. Stem up, this goes away from the seat. Makes sense, right? It's really obvious if you've got a cutaway. <laughs> 
But the problem is, cutaways tend to leak. So when you go to a job site, it usually looks like this. It doesn't look like this. So you go to a job site, and what you see is this. How do you, and you have no numbers. Is there a way to tell if it's normally open or normally closed? All right, now, I want you to think. See, I can tell you. I want you to remember this. I guess this is the third takeaway I want you to get from this class. All right. <laughs> yeah, I start out saying there was only one. Now I'm up to three. Uh, okay, I lied. Sue me. All right. I want you to consider this. You need to rebuild this valve. Where does this assembly come out of the valve? Won't it come out the top? All right, let's say you've got a normally closed valve that you need to rebuild. Can this come out the top? No, because that is in the way. So, how do you tell? You look at the bottom. See this? It's got a, a nut on it. All right, that's so you can take this assembly out the bottom. All right, is this something that you can commit to, to memory? Let's say you go up to a flanged valve, a six-inch six flanged valve looks very different from this. If you go to that valve and it's sort of smooth on the top with a stem coming out, is that normally open or normally closed? Normally closed, because you'll notice on the bottom you've got your your access. All right. So, is that fun? <laughs> All right. I think that's some good stuff. So that's three things that I really want you to get out of this. Wilka. Well, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. But now your your um, your actuators. Now, if you have a mixing type valve, you can have electric actuators that will go up and down. See, typically electric actuators rotate. They, they lend themselves well to ball valves unless you put some kind of adapter in there. All right, now we're going, we're seeing this type of electric valve. Uh, I've got another one around here somewhere that uh, I'm not, oh, here it is. Uh, Snyder has just come out with this type to you know mimic this. You see the similarities? Just two different brands. Uh, they're similar in what they do. If you've got a mixing valve, a globe valve that's a mixing valve, uh, this is just a more straightforward way of putting an electric actuator on it. Uh, otherwise, if you go with this style actuator, <laughs> you have to have some kind of adapter. Um, but a ball valve, on the other hand, the actuator can go right on. Now, you notice there's a difference between this valve and this valve. All right, two different, and, and I'm, I'm thinking more the how it mount, the actuator mounts. This is more of a direct mount. This mounts, it goes over the shaft. Uh, just two different brands, S similar things. But there's one thing to be aware of. Um, this, if you turn it, it has stops. If you have a, a Blumo valve, this, the insides can actually spin 360 degrees, so you need to be mindful. Uh, if you get a separate valve and a separate actuator and you marry the two in the field, just be aware, I'm sorry, of uh, how, you know, this, this turns and is that compatible with how this turns? So just, just be aware. And I've got a slide that kind of clarifies that.
Uh, by the way, just a, a little note, this looks a little bit different, doesn't it? This is what's called a pressure independent valve, sometimes uh, nicknamed pick valves, pressure independent valve. We've been doing that on the air side for eons. Okay, uh, um, our VAV boxes, goodness, back in the 60s we had pressure independent valves and what that means is on an air valve, air supplied by an air handler, you've got all these valves opening and closing and of course they're two-way dampers and um, as these dampers are commanded open and closed by the controllers and the actuators, uh, isn't it going to take in more in, or less of the medium pressure that's air that's produced by that air handler? Isn't that going to change the static pressure? Now, if this is opened at a certain amount, if you have a higher static pressure coming in, won't you have more air going out and if that pressure reduces, you'll have less air. Is that reasonable? All right, what we've done to correct that is pitot tubes sense the airflow, goes to a controller that talks to the thermostat, that talks to the actuator, that will sense the flow, and if the flow is too much, it'll because the static pressure goes up, it will damper down a little bit. If the static pressure goes down, it'll open up to maintain a constant airflow you know, into the room. Been doing that for a long time. We typically have not done that on the water side because it's a little bit harder to do. But now the technology has changed such that uh, we're, we're seeing more and more and more pressure independent control valves, pick valves. And this is done uh, through a mechanism here. You've got some orifices and springs and things like that. The downside of this is it tends to have a little bit of a higher pressure drop, makes our pumps work a little bit more, or we have to have larger pumps. And, you know, as the pump is moving the water, it drinks energy and it's expensive to move water. Would you agree? All right. Um, uh, yes, sir. You have an AB port? Yes. And uh, the one in my left hand, the arrows are combining, going out the left side. All port. right. For the streamers, we're, we're talking about A, B, and AB ports. Right. All right. Uh, and uh, this one, the arrows are combining, going out the left hand side. This one, in the right hand uh, side, the AB port is on the left side, but the arrows are combining and going out the Remember, one is mixing, one is diverting, so you have different water paths. But looking at your diagram up there, you don't have an AB on that bottom uh, drawing. Uh, it's just missing. Okay, so AB That's right. on the right-hand side. Yeah, he, he's talking about the AB here and here. This would be AB. Okay. All right, now, let's... Um, Talking about pick valves, Belimos come out with what they call the energy valve, and it's a uh, pressure independent valve that does not have springs, so it's a ball valve, so it really does not hamper the flow very much. It does control it, and it incorporates a flow sensor, and it incorporates two temperature sensors, so you got delta T and you got flow, so this thing understands BTUs and you can talk to it with your computer, suck in the points with BACnet. There's all kinds of good things that this valve will do for you. It's much smarter and now with the technology being as it is today, the price of course is coming down. So that is much more affordable. What they're trying to do is get away from three-way valves that blend 55 degree and 45 degree water and send all of a sudden, now you look at your chiller and I got 48 degree water coming back to my chiller and my chiller's not happy. I mean, it can handle it. It can throttle back, but it really likes a load. 
All right. So if we can incorporate two-way valves, uh, then we can employ different strategies at our central plant. We can go with uh, what's called variable uh, uh, primary secondary flow or variable primary flow and and those uh, solve some of our issues or the low delta T issue uh, helps with the energy helps them drink a little less power it's uh, and it reduces our pumping costs and remember our pumps are energy hogs all right let's continue on uh, remember I talked to you about the character characterizing valve in the ball valve um, because we want when a ball valve is op cracked open a little bit we want a small amount of flow and so that's why these v valves tend to have characterization flow discs inside there and in fact if you look in, in this, I know the streamers can't really see, but you'll see a characterized disc inside this valve that looks somewhat like this. And what that does is that at a low signal, if your controller is giving it 2 volts, 3 volts, whatever, and so you've got a small opening, you're going to have a small amount of flow, but with that small amount of flow, the drop of water inside the coil are there longer and it has better heat transfer as long as you've got some turbulence in there. Um, but so what happens is as the valve opens the heat transfer kind of mirrors it so the result output is kind of linear. It's sort of straight line. So that's how they've gotten the ball valves to perform better as a control valve. Okay. Now, uh, when we talk about damper actuators, uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but I said you could put those actuators any position you want. It doesn't matter. However, with a water valve, uh, position matters. Uh, if you look, you can have them up and down any direction this way. You can have it up like this. You just cannot mount it where you can mount it. It's not recommended to mount a water valve like this. Why is that? Any leakage or condensate can, you know, this, you got electronics and electricity in here. Make sure you have it at least, you know, no more than say a 45 uh, up and down is great. I have gone to job sites. I have seen valves put in just like this. And I've seen the water stains, water marks on the bottom of the actuator. Don't do that when you're uh, mounting these things. Now, uh, this slide is talking specifically about Belimo and how it interfaces with their um, actuators. Um, here's an example of, of an actuator. Notice you don't have the long stem that this accepts a, a regular type of actuator. Um, and, so, and, and this stem in this ball, that ball inside can go 360 degrees. It, it, there is no stop, so you need to be aware if you have a valve and you have an uh, actuator that are separate and you're going to marry them in the field, you've got to make sure you position this ball right and the cuts in the stem give you the flow. So if you look here, we have flow here, flow is stopped. Because, see, there is no flow right here because there's no cut. If we look here, uh, in this position, we are flowing A to AB. No, no flow on A. Okay. So just be aware. You need to make sure that it is positioned right. And then make sure that 
the left and right action will spin that the correct direction. Just a little paying attention, it, it's, it's not that big a deal. Now, uh, another thing, and, and we're down to our last couple of slides here, so we've almost made it. Hang in there. All right. <laughs> How am I doing on time? All right. Yeah, I'm a little early. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, let you get out there just in time to get in the thick of traffic. All right. Uh, it's important that we send the right flow to our coil. And, and what we're trying to do is have the pressure characteristics of this valve kind of match up with the character, characteristics of the coil, all right? The coil has a certain pressure drop, is that right? And so does this valve. And that gets into CV. Uh, CV is just the, uh, it, it's a function of, of how much that valve will flow. And that flow is dependent on pressure. And CV is noted as, you know, assuming one PSI pressure drop. So, a 5 CV valve at one pre PSI differential will flow 5 GPM. Uh, this valve, let's see if it tells me the CV. This has a, well, I can't read it. Can, can you see the CV on this stamp? On the tag. On the tag, it should tell us the CV. 4.7 CV. So how much can that flow? Well, it depends on the pressure drop, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. All right. I, I kind of set you up a, a little bit. Um, uh, because, see, our coils typically don't have a 1 PSI pressure drop. Uh, it, it depends on the application. Now, if it's a chill water coil and a fan coil, air handler, uh, you know, if, if you want just sort of to get a rough estimate, if you assume 4 PSI, you might be in the neighborhood. But like if you're looking at a um, water source heat pump, it has a coaxial coils. Uh, they typically have a much higher pressure drop. It has maybe a... Um, a 10 PSI pressure drop, it, again, it depends on the size and the manufacturer. So the, the, uh, you can Google the model, get the catalog data, and, and you can get that information. And then you can plug it in here. So uh, I said rule of thumb, and be careful with rules of thumb. You know, just <laughs> this gets you in the ballpark. But let's say we've got a four PSI pressure drop. We want to mimic that with our valve, so we want to assume about a four PSI pressure drop across our valve. If we want to know the CV of the valve, then, um, and we know the flow, and typically we will know the GPM of the unit, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, if we know we want 10 CV, I'm sorry, 10 GPM, and, and there's a 4 PSI pressure drop across the coil, then we just work the formula uh, 4 delta P, square root of 4 is what? 2. All right, so if we know our GPM is 10, 10 divided by 2 equals 5. I did that for, for easy math. But uh, that's how you calculate CV. CV is important. It's very important. Now, let me illustrate a real-world application. Now... <sighs> You're going to have to forgive me if you hate chillers because it seems like everything I do gravitates towards a, a chiller. So if we've got a condenser, 
on a chiller, we're going to come out to a cooling tower and uh, go into a cooling tower. We're going to come out and we got a pump here. Everybody with me? All right. Now, let's say it's 50 degrees outside. We don't have to, we haven't had to worry about that temperature in Atlanta for quite some time. <laughs> All right, if we've got, uh, well, let's say it's not 50 degree outside, let's say we got 50 degree water. It's easier because if it's 50 degree outside, I don't know what my water temperature is, it depends on the wet bulb. And typically, we're three degrees off wet bulb is what our water temperature is. But uh, 50 degrees, if, if I send 50 degrees to that uh, chiller, whether it's a screw or a centrifugal, I can tell you, uh, does anybody think that's a good idea? Well, it kind of depends. Some manufacturers, York says, yeah, give me 50 degree water, I'll take it all day long. There's other manufacturers that say, oh, oh. <laughs> and, and uh, I, I had a, uh, a York uh, screw chiller that you try to give it 50 degree water, mm -mm, it's going gonna, it's gonna to talk to you. It's going to talk loud. You're going to hear it uh, from the street. It's, it's, it's going to scream so loud. All right. So what do we do? We uh, do put in a head pressure control valve. All right. How many of you have seen a little... Uh, pinch off valve right here in this. Now, so, of course, sometimes we do bypasses, but you know, in this illustration, we're doing it the cheap way because this is how it was done many moons ago. It's very, very common. If you go up to an older chiller that hasn't been retrofitted, it's likely you'll see this. All right, so we are taking this temperature and uh, feeding it, you know, we got some kind of uh, controller. I mean, it may be something like this. Uh, you want something that acts kind of fast on the control side, and then you want an actuator that works kind of slow. Uh, but let's say we've got 10 inch condenser water piping right here. What size valve do we have? It's going to be 10 inch, right? Probably. It shouldn't be. That's a mistake. <laughs> but often, if it's being installed and the, the pipe fitter sees the drawings, he's piping up 10, degree, uh, 10 inch pipe. Here, in the plans, it calls for this valve, but if it doesn't say what size valve, they're just going to go with 10 inch because it's a whole lot easier. Now, you take a 10 inch butterfly valve and you crack it open just a little bit, you send it, if it's a, a 3 to 8 psi uh, pneumatic or a, a, a 2 to 10 volt electric signal, you send it a couple volt or three volts and it cracks open, guess what? 50 degree water, you've already got too much water. Because a 10 inch valve, you crack that thing open a little bit, you've got massive amounts of water. So, what we rule of thumb, <laughs> you downsize one pipe size of this and, and just understand, I'm not giving you engineering advice. I'm, I'm just giving you the gist of it. This needs to be smaller than this. Now, if you've got a chiller that this fall, and fall starts like right now. <laughs> so, so the cooler weather has got to be coming soon. Uh, and you start getting in with that cooler air cooler water and this your, your chillers are hiccuping and you look at your head pressure control valve and you've got a line size valve here that is your problem so what can you do let's say we've got the, we've got the problem uh, you know you could just take and and put a 
small valve, if this is 10 inch, you know, maybe put a, I, I, I don't know, I, uh, I'm just pulling this out of the air. Uh, I, I love to go with screw pipe when I can, screw valves, the price is so much less. <laughs> uh, the difference between a two and a half inch valve that, uh, or th uh, three inch with flanges, screw versus flanges is, is tremendous. Uh, if you can go with a screw pipe valve, uh, by, uh, put it in parallel and do the controller where you open this valve first, then you start opening this valve, you'll have better control. Make sense? Of course, it's better if we do the bypasses, but half the time when we do our pipe bypasses, we do that wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, what can we do? If if you can, if your uh, chiller has a control panel that's uh, electronic, it often will be able to control these valves. It, it depends on the age of your equipment. But if you've got a newer chiller, you're more likely not to have the head pressure control problems because we've sort of wised up to, to doing this a little bit better. And if you've got a new chiller, you might have a better setup. Maybe, maybe, it, it all depends on who did the job. Yes, yeah. Uh, but the better way is to actually do differential pressure across the two vessels, but that's, that's a, a different topic. All right, so now, uh, another, another scenario. I've got a mechanical room that has an air handler. Um, in, in there we've got our piping risers for our condenser water. Um, over here we've got a water source heat pump that's being installed uh, for a tenant. Common scenario, right? And so what do we have to do? We have to pull off here and go out of the mechanical room. We've got to go down the hallway. Then we've got to go over here and then uh, over and then back. Typical. <laughs> All right. We got easy, easy, you know, 125 feet or whatever, where straight is probably half that. Oh, wait a minute. Did I say we've got that much? No, we've got more because we got two pipes. We got there and back. I've got, I need 10 GPM. My connection size on this thing, I don't, it might be a half inch. Uh, might be three quarter. D depends on the manufacturer. Let's, you're not going to pipe this three quarter inch pipe, are you? Because you got, we've got to have this 10 GPM over 250 feet uh, pressure drops, and, and we got all kinds of 90s and all that, so our equivalent feet's probably closer to 300. So, what are we going to do? We're going to take and pipe it probably an inch and a quarter. And again, this is, I'm just pulling numbers. If there's a flaw in, in, in somewhere, just go with me, okay? You know, I, this is just to give you the gist. You need to go through the piping, the pipe resistance tables per 100 foot and, and, and you know, figure this out for real. But I, I'm just giving you, we're, we're taking a tour, so to speak, of this process. All right, so I've got inch and a quarter pipe. Let's say I've got a half inch connection. If all of a sudden I put a control valve in here, that's, uh, and I've got half inch and I've got inch and a quarter going in and half inch coming out real, real quick, uh, I might get into a situation where I've, I've uh, I've gone from big to, to small. The flow is the same in that pipe. If I've got a big pipe and I've got a small pipe, the flow will be the same. Is that a reasonable 
thing for me to say? All right. Now, if the flow is the same, but the area is vastly different, the pressures will be different. Is that correct? All right. And so, and, and then you could come back out here. You could have a situation where, and it depends on the flow, the pressure drops, actually even right down to the temperature of the water. You can get a flashing of the water coming out of the valve. Now, we were real tuned in to this problem with pumps. Um, but sometimes we have this problem with valves uh, where the pressure changes too quick in too short an interval and you can actually cause bubbles to go into the water and then those bubbles co collapse. Now, uh, again, we're more tuned into this with a pump. So let's think about it with a pump. Cavitation. Everybody's heard of cavitation, and you've heard it. What's it sound like? Rocks. You're pumping rocks, marbles. All right. Often, I see it more on the condenser side. Why? Well, we've got a tower, and let's say the tower is right out there. We got a pump that pumps from the tower and comes in, and and we're pumping through a strainer and and uh, that pressure drop, all of a sudden, when that pump picks up that water, it drops the pressure. What temperature does water boil at? What's the pressure? All right, I heard a 212, and then I had a, someone ask the question, what's the pressure? It depends. Because water can boil at 20 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're a refrigeration mechanic, you know that. That's why we pull... Our uh, refrigeration, our, our circuits, you know, 500 microns to allow any vapor to, to um, any water to flash off, and then we want to sweep it out with nitrogen. All right? Okay. Boiling point of water is dependent on the pressure. So if W that uh, pump sucks that uh, water and you draw you drop that pressure and you got a lot, little bit of heat in that you actually will form vapor bubbles the water will flash off and then as the pressure increases towards discharge the water vapor bubbles does what collapses all right. It's actually the opposite of explodes, it implodes. And every time it implodes, it sends out a little sonic ping. That's the noise you hear. All right. And as it does that, it's sort of like if you take a piece of sand and throw it against an object, is it a big deal? Not really, typically, but if you continue to do that at a high velocity, we call that sandblasting. And you can wear something out by sandblasting. That's what the water vapor implosions do. It basically sonically impinges your surfaces and to the point that you can destroy the surfaces. You can destroy uh, a pump impeller. And in the similar type, it, there's some differences, yeah. I'm just trying to draw an example here. Valves can do the same thing. And if you have a valve that's cavitating, eventually it will destroy the valve. There's, there's exceptions. There's valves that have special materials you can design for it, but we typically don't see that. Typically, you go up to a valve and it sounds like it's passing BBs through that thing. You've got a problem, and if you don't fix it, it'll eventually erode that valve. So let's a uh, little road of, uh, rule of thumb: uh, don't downsize, and uh, you know more than half the size of the pipe. All right, that concludes my presentation on valves and actuators. I hope. Uh, you you got some good information you can take away from here. All right.
Yes. Well, there you go. Great stuff from Control Pro, Tim Shambly. Hope you enjoyed the valve training series. You can get part one and two on the YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe to that. Also go over to controltrends.com. You can subscribe over there as well. Anytime we do a post, you'll be notified immediately. We don't put everything uh, that we put on Control Trends up on YouTube. We do a lot of stuff with the podcast and some other stuff like that. So uh, check us out on both those. We appreciate you. So remember, be bold, stay in control, stay relevant. We'll see you next time.